Thank you. Good morning, everyone. It's uh, heartwarming to see the hall absolutely filled today. Must be close on about 300 people here. Would that be about right? Um, you'll forgive me if I seem to be a little bit nervous this morning. I'm, I'm a, a follower of Kilmarnock Football Club, so I'm just not used to crowds of this size. <laughs> <laughs> Very eloquent what Dan has just uh, gone through. My thrust today is, well, what do you do next? There's no such thing as a free lunch. And I know you're going to have lunch here today, but I'd like to think perhaps you would earn it. Right. Apathy is our enemy. And I made this point last year at the Assembly. Apathy is the enemy. Fighting a lone cause can be a soul-destroying experience. It will sap your strength and your energy like nothing on earth. And it will trigger doubts in your mind. It robs you of your confidence. But most of all, it plants the seeds, the cancerous seeds of apathy. Now, we're always, almost the last kick of the ball at last year's assembly on the Friday afternoon. Someone very foolishly put a microphone in my hand. Not always a good idea, but I don't like to miss an opportunity. And I issued a challenge to the members of the Assembly who were still in the hall on that Friday afternoon, and it was this. Find someone in the hall that you're not acquainted with. Exchange your contact details and keep in regular touch throughout the course of the next year to compare notes and the progress that you're making and what your continuing actions are in the fight against poverty. But most importantly, that was about encouraging each other to keep the fight going and reinforce that particular message that you're not fighting alone. So I know that many of you here are, are, are in the, the Assembly for the first time, but I do know that there will certainly be some people in the hall who were here last year. And I'm going to have to ask for a bit of honesty. So those of you who were here on that occasion last year, could you raise your hands if you took up that challenge? One, two. We have three, four hands, five hands in the room. Now, that's a pretty small percentage. I would say that's about 1.333% of the number of people sitting in here today. So let's not have that happen this time round. It's what we do next that's going to count. So apathy really is our enemy, and we have to keep the fight going. So from my perspective, what particular progress has been made since last year's assembly? Now, some of you may know, in fact, many of you may know, uh, I was involved for the past couple of years in carrying out some community research. And uh, we were looking at, at ex-offenders' experiences of temporary accommodation. When, when they left prison. Because, you know, there is an absolute direct relationship between criminality and poverty. We can see it in all our communities. But one of the major recommendations that we made was that welfare benefits should be allowed to be claimed prior to leaving prison. So that when you actually got back out into the community, your benefits would be in place and the likelihood of having to commit crime to survive would be reduced. Now, I can tell you with absolute certainty that a copy of that report, out of jail but still not free, and there are other research reports available, but a copy of that report landed on the desk of someone in a very, very senior position at the DWP. So you can imagine my absolute surprise in October last year when Nick Clegg appears on the national news, chundering on about how these people coming out of prison need to be met at the gates by workplace advisors and to help them get their benefits into place. That's actually something that my project has been doing for five years, so there's nothing like copying a good idea. Having said that, from March this year, so two weeks ago today, Prisoners are now entitled to put their benefit claims in 
six weeks before leaving prison. Now, I can't claim that this has come as, as a result of that report. Now, you, you may be entitled to think that. I, I couldn't possibly comment. <laughs> but what I can tell you is, having carried out that research, with a group of people who had been previously voiceless and marginalised, who set out with a view that no one ever asked their opinions, let alone listened to them, they have been absolutely astonished at the reaction to that report. So it shows really, ladies and gentlemen, that if, if we can take action and get the ball rolling, build momentum, and maintain our tenacity, then yes, we can make positive changes. Today, though, I want to ask you, are we tackling poverty or are we merely talking about it? The difference between those two is actually just one letter of the alphabet. If you're into anagrams, the letter C. If you take the letter C out of tackling, then we're left with talking. Right, what does the letter C represent? Well, it could be conservatism. It could be coalitions. It could be cuts. It could be Clegg. It could be Cameron. So as you see, make no mistake about this, there are quite a lot of Cs contributing to poverty in Scotland today. <laughs> now, for me, the most important C that I haven't yet mentioned is our communities. That's where we have to take the fight, out to the communities. We have to take our communities back from the brink, and we have to galvanise them we have to energise them, and most importantly, we have to politicise them, and we have to think the unthinkable. Why? Why do we need to politicise these communities? It's very simple. Because the ultimate answer in the fight against poverty is going to be political. But in a country where only 50% of the people will get off their backsides and vote, how on earth can we get the influence that we need among politicians to go out there and carry our cause and give us the results that we're looking for? The answer for me is to get out into those communities and connect with the other 50% of people who don't vote. Let's get out there and deliver our message at grassroots level. And let's get people to believe that by becoming involved, they can help to deliver the changes that we all desire we all need. Now, probably doesn't look like it, but I am old enough to remember when the local councillors lived either next door to me or in the next street to me. And they were well known because they lived in that community. They were part of that community and they cared about that community and they looked after the interests of that community. These were never people who had been shipped in by the party to contest what they considered to be a safe seat. They were the original community leaders and community activists. So perhaps now the time is right to eliminate these so-called safe seats. The time is right to start putting in place an action plan for the local elections that will take place, not this May, but in four years' time. Let's get our community candidates identified and our anti-poverty candidates identified, and let's take back these communities and fight poverty from within. Let's aim to get some control and influence within the local councils as a starting point to further our agendas and as a springboard to even greater influence. It's time to get the message across to all our politicians, MPs, MSPs, MEPs, 
that we're going to cancel the gravy train and in future they will have to earn the right to represent us. And do you know what? If they don't deliver, then we use our numbers and our voting powers to replace them at the first opportunity. Now, in the 1970s and the 1980s, I was a great advocate of a mantra called grow your own. And ultimately, you know, that, that it led me to spend several years at Her Majesty's pleasure. You know, although Her Majesty was not particularly pleased, I might add. But, um, <laughs> but I'm going to urge the members of this assembly to reinvent that mantra of grow your own. If we truly desire a breed of politicians who will deliver the outcomes that we want, then why don't we grow our own? Simple. Let's grow them from the ranks of the grandparents out there, those whose hearts are breaking at the thought of a lack of opportunity for their following generations. Let's grow them from the parents who want a better deal and a better future for their kids. Let's grow them from the disaffected youths hanging about the street corners looking for direction. Let's grow them from the disillusioned, disaffected and disenfranchised voters in your communities. Let us go out to these communities and inspire people to aspire. Now, where do we get inspiration? It's always difficult to get inspiration. But when I need inspiration, I always recall the story of a guy called Cliff Young. I don't know if any of you ever heard of Cliff Young. Cliff Young was a farmer in Australia. And at the age of 61, Cliff decided that he was going to take part in the Great Australian Marathon, right? Now, the Great Australian Marathon is an ultra-marathon. It's, it's a, a running race between Sydney and Melbourne. And the distance of that is somewhere in the region of 545 miles, right? And it attracts all of the world's top distance runners, the ultra-marathon runners. But your bold Cliff turned up for this race at the age of 61 wearing a pair of overalls and a pair of work boots. And of course, everyone thought he was there as a spectator. But when he went up to the registration desk and picked up his number as a runner, he was immediately set upon by the media and the press. And he became the object of ridicule. But unbelievably, not only did Cliff enter the race, but he won it. And more unbelievable than that, he beat the long-standing record for the race by almost a day and a half. Now, is that inspiration or what? How did he do it? Quite simple. Cliff was brought up on a sheep farm. And they had 2,000 acres to farm and about 20,000 sheep. And they were quite poor. They didn't have a horse, didn't have a four before or a tractor, or any sort of vehicle. And Cliff's job on the farm was to make sure the stock was safe. So if a storm threatened or the weather was worsening or the, 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 live, the livestock were, were at risk, it was Cliff's job to get out there and round them up, over 2,000 acres. And as Cliff himself said, sometimes it could take me up to three days to round up the stock. So I had to keep running night and day. I couldn't stop. That was how I protected my livestock and my livelihood. Now Cliff, not being part of the established cohort of ultra marathon runners who knew what this was all about, he had no preconceived idea of what this race was about or how it should be run. He didn't know that he was supposed to run for 18 hours and then sleep for six. He just kept on running. And by the time they realised what he was doing, he was so far in front they couldn't catch him to tell him that he was doing it all wrong. <laughs> so do you know what? If ever there was a classic case of the absence of truth setting someone free, this is it. This is it. You will find inspiration here. Because very often it's the truth as told to us by other people 
that holds us back, and it prevents us from realizing our full potential. You can't do this, or you can't do that, or you must conform to our idea of what is normal. However, if you start to believe in your own version of the truth, of what is right and what is normal, then there's nothing on this earth that can prevent you from achieving everything to which you aspire. So over the next two days, as we reaffirm our commitment to tackling, not talking about tackling poverty, and agreeing actions that are required both individually and collectively, just let me leave you with this one final thought. And bear in mind, bear in mind, I might well come back next year and ask for a show of hands who's done it. But the final thought is this. It's about what happens next. If we truly and sincerely want to change the future, the simplest and most unerring way for us to do that is to invent the future. Thank you. Charlie, thank you very much indeed. Um, in, in a policy arena that's stuffed full of statistics and uh, data and, and research evidence, uh, you've reminded us of the power of the story, the power, the enduring power of the good idea. Um, and uh, the theme for this event is actually around a call to act. So when we get into our evidence sessions today and tomorrow, those are not just about uh, lamenting uh, the effect of welfare reform or sending out critical messages to governments. We may even want to tweet the Chancellor, Ross, before we're done tomorrow. Who knows? But more than that, I think our responsibilities are to identify practical actions which can be uh, enacted at all different levels, from governments and parliaments to, to the grassroots. So thank you very much both to Charlie and Danny for uh, setting the scene for us. Now we have about 10 minutes, just for a very brief run around the tables. Um, this is our version of the assembly speed dating, so your chance to get to know who's sitting next to you if you don't already. What we'd like to do for just a few minutes is take your views on what you've heard so far and share some of your own uh, insights and experiences about what's happening in your sector or in your community and perhaps start uh, mapping out on the paper in front of you just some of the ideas you want to discuss today and tomorrow, some of the bright ideas you want to share with others. And we won't do feedback now, but your thoughts will be captured and they'll all be written up and shared in the report of the event and online. So shall we take 10 minutes? There should be someone at your table um, who'll identify themselves just to do the introductions. And then after that, we'll go straight into our first panel session. Thank you very much.